Every year we have a special celebration on Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Sunday. Uh, we have um, a program this afternoon at the community college. There's a panel um, who will be talking about where we go from here. Um, that's at two, from 2 to 4 at the community college. And tomorrow, um, the annual Kansas City, Kansas uh, Martin Luther King Day celebration will be at 11 o'clock at the um, Reardon Center in downtown Case K. Um, I hope you will plan to attend one or both of those events. They're great, a great opportunity in our community to see the richness of the heritage of the Dr. King legacy continuing to be lived out. Um, and the highlight, I think, of the Reardon Center is after the program, they offer scholarships um, from every high school in Wyandotte County, all nine high schools in Wyandotte County. Um, students do an essay contest um, writing about the importance of the legacy of Dr. King, and then they award um, college scholarships accordingly. Um, so that's always the highlight for me to see the young people and their reflection on what King means today. Um, because as I've said, Dr. King isn't just a history lesson, but in fact a call to action um, to think about. And as we were thinking about this service for this year, we were thinking about, you know, Dr. King um, stood up for people who were riding on the back of the bus. Uh, there was a time of segregation in our country, a time of segregation in our community, and even in our churches. Um, when African Americans were expected to sit at the back of the bus, um, figuratively and literally. And so the question then um, we talked about was, well, who's still at the back of the bus? Are there voices from people at the back of the bus that we need to hear from today um, to remind us of the work that is yet to be done? Um, this church uh, made a commitment in 2002 when we rededicated a cornerstone of our church um, for repentance, reconciliation, and joy we had a service of repentance for the historic racism of not only our denomination, but this congregation. Um, because this church was built in 1965 when our denomination was still officially segregated. And we weren't a formally um, integrated until 1968. And we wanted to be a church sitting in the geographic center of a county that has no ethnic majority. And we thought if the church is to be a foretaste of the banquet of heaven, we should reflect that banquet in every way possible. So we began a journey of diversifying our congregation. Um, a lot of small things, diversifying the art in our church. I had an African-American pastor who was talking to me, was here at Trinity, and he said, well, all your, pictures of, all your pictures in the church are of white people. And I said, really? <laughs> I'd, never, <laughs> I'd never looked at them. Um, so I did. Um, but we began a journey, and the journey really began with listening. Um, the journey really began with listening. Uh, listening to the community, listening to the things that we can do as a people um, to build a diverse church um, that's going to be representative of our community and of the kingdom of God. Today, I want to invite you to listen to some voices um, from some folks who have some experience in the back of the bus. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an important journey to listen. I want to juxtapose listening to um, two things that we value I would suggest we overvalue in this country. Um, we overvalue, I believe, understanding, and we overvalue agreement. So when you think about something, um, we always work for understanding. And I'll give you an example. Um, healthcare in the United States. There's an easy topic, yes? There are very few people who understand it. There are very few people who understand all the nuances of it, who understand all the implications of it, and so there's a real need to educate ourselves to even learn what it means. But I will confess this, what I don't understand about healthcare will always far exceed what I do understand. The same then if you take what we do understand, then you try to get to agreement. And even people who understand it, the seven or eight people in America who understand healthcare, don't even agree on it, amen? So as a faith community, I think we need to focus our faith efforts on listening rather than even understanding or agreeing. So if you think of God's truth, which is this big, and you think of the amount of God's truth that's been um, given to humans over time and space, it's about this much, and then you think about the tradition that we live in, which is about this much, and then you think about the congregation that we're in, I can't even get the woman across the kitchen table from me to agree on stuff. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, 
But listening that is born of Christian love helps us to take the things we do not understand and set them aside. Listening that is born of Christian love helps us to take things on which we do not agree and set those aside. Because I believe the act of listening is an act of opening our hearts, our minds, and our doors to the people of God who have a truth to share with us that we could not possibly grasp if we don't take time to listen. So we have three um, voices that you're going to hear today, all of whom have some experience on the back of the bus. Um, Orlando, who is from Mexico um, and came to this country several years ago, um, graduated high school and college in this country, and is a graduate of St. Paul School of Theology, and is beginning his journey through ordination um, in the United Methodist Church. You'll hear from uh, Barbara Menifee, uh, Barbara who grew up in the National Baptist tradition, um, has spent a lot of time in the African Methodist Episcopal tradition, and um, is active here at Trinity, and is on our leadership team here, um, helping to lead with our worship coordination and teaching our disciple Bible study. You also hear from Patrick, who's been leading our worship here uh, for the last eight years. Um, Patrick, who grew up in the Wesleyan tradition, and his father, a Wesleyan preacher. Uh, Patrick called to ministry, and certainly his music ministry has been a blessing to uh, many churches through the years, but certainly a blessing to ours here today. All three of these individuals are in leadership at Trinity. All three of these individuals have preached on Sunday. You've already heard their voice preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ right here at Trinity. And today, I invite you to listen uh, to their voice, to their experience of what it might be like to spend some time on the back of the bus. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Orlando, and I am sitting on the back of the bus. How, you may ask? Well, just look at me. I live in this country without documents for about 14 years, what some people may call um, an illegal alien. And I always ask myself, um, how can you call a human being illegal for immigrating to a country that was originally founded by immigrants? That just never makes sense to me. It's funny because when we humans try to force a certain group of people to sit on the back of the bus, God tends to get on this bus, and God tends to stir things up that changes things for the good of the people who sit on the back of the bus. You know, without documents, I wasn't supposed to come to this country, but I did. You know, without documents, I wasn't supposed to go to college and graduate, but I did. <laughs> Without documents, um, I wasn't supposed to go to grad school, but I did, and I got my, my Master's of Divinity. Without documents, I wasn't supposed to get a work permit, but I did. It feels like the system was pushing me to sit on the back of the bus. But God got on this bus, and when God went all the way to the back, and he made me get up from my seat and sit on the front of the bus. But when I sit in the front of the bus and I look around, I just feel like I don't belong. <laughs> And people who sit on the front of the bus made sure that I knew that I didn't belong up there. I used to think that someday I was going to get documents and I was going to feel like I did belong in the front of the bus. I thought that having a work permit and a social security number will give me that right to sit on the front and say, yeah, I belong here, and this is where I'm going to be. 
Well, it has been a year since I got my work permit and my social security number. But for some reason, I still feel like I don't belong. Why? Because every time I apply for a job and I tell them I went to high school in the United States, I went to college in Iowa, I went to grad school in Missouri, they still look at me and they ask me, um, so how is your English? And <laughs> after I stare at them for a minute, just in amazement, I just say, well, it was good enough that I graduated from seminary. <laughs> I don't know. But you see, now I'm sitting on the back of the bus, maybe simply for being Latino. But you know what, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the next bus stop. And you know why? Because I think in the next bus stop, God is gonna get on the bus again. And God is gonna change things. Some of the people sitting up front are gonna be cheering and waiting for this change to happen. Other people who are on the front, they're gonna feel really uncomfortable. And others are just gonna be plain mad. But you know, people like us on the back of the bus, we're gonna be really happy <laughs> because we know it's gonna be something good. Man, I just, I'm just waiting and I cannot wait for God to get on this bus. Voices from the back of the bus. And I am a living witness of being one of those voices. As a young child, I learned early that there were things I couldn't do, places I couldn't go, and dreams that I would not be able to fulfill because of the color of my skin. When I was 18 years old, I and many other African Americans marched down Woodward Avenue in Detroit, Michigan. The march ended at Cobo Hall where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King presented us with his famous speech, I Have a Dream. I was mesmerized by his speech. And like all marches during the 60s, this march was held in order to bring attention to racism, poverty, and economic injustice. And after listening to his speech, my 18-year-old mind jumped for joy. I was full of hope for African Americans. I thought to myself that maybe, just maybe, I can fulfill my dreams just as any white person can. Then I grew up. And with each year, I have experienced much racial discrimination based upon just looking at me, the color of my skin. During Dr. King's time on this earth, he focused on poverty and racism. Sadly, these issues remain unsolved today. It is disturbing because it tells me that for many people, justice still does not exist. The gap between the rich and the poor has reached depression era standards. African Americans earn less, die earlier, and are imprisoned at disproportionate rates than whites. And even in this age of President Obama, young black men are more likely to be locked up than graduate from college. And the leading cause of death for black men under 30 is homicide. The tragedy of Hurricane Katrina exposed in stark 
and shameful ways America's enduring racial and class inequalities. And even though I'm a long ways from that 18-year-old with great dreams, at my age of 70 years old, I still hope for myself and other African Americans who are my age. First, to be respected for the person that I am. Number two, to be able to speak on any subject in a passionate manner and not be labeled an angry black woman, or in a, my husband's case, an angry black man. My main hope is for the generations behind me. I pray that the gap between African Americans and whites in every aspect will be eliminated. Started with, starting with young black males being able to walk in a store without being followed and to walk home without being shot. That my generation hey, hey, will be the last voices heard from the back of the bus. During racial, does, does racial discrimination still exist? Of course it does. And here are just two examples, just two. I taught elementary school in an all-white district. There were only a few African-Americans, African-American teachers in the district. The courts ruled that the district must hire six black teachers each year. We were treated as if we should be grateful that they allowed us to be there. One parent said to me, you are the teacher? And if I had responded to her disrespectful comment to me as an accredited teacher with anger, it is possible that I would have lost my job. Now let me tell you about my husband. My husband had been, has been an over-the-road truck driver for over 30 years. And during his 25th year, he faced one of the worst experiences in his life. One of his white colleagues told him that he was going to get him fired. He had been making racial comments to Danny all along. Danny tried to ignore him. The colleague told his, their boss that Danny said he was going to blow up the workplace. This was an out and out lie. One evening when Danny returned from a trip, there were a sea of police cars waiting for him at the terminal. He didn't know what was going on. He stopped the truck and faced a number of guns pointed at him. He was told to get down on his knees. He was handcuffed and searched and humiliated while the man who lied on him stood there laughing. He was fired and later got his job back through the union. Danny is not a criminal, was never a criminal, never been in trouble, does not bother anyone, and yet was treated like a criminal because he is black. So what keeps us going? Sometimes I wonder, but I do know the only thing is our faith in God. And I believe that one of my assignments while being here on this earth is to be the best example that I can be to both black and white young people. <laughs> By not just talking about problems in this world, but taking action toward building a world through godly love. It is wonderful to honor Dr. King once a year in church services, but it is going to take all of us working together in order to build the kind of world that Martin Luther King dreamed of and gave his life for. Amen. I'm not going to stay up here long, but I'm, 
up here for a reason. And um, it's a personal reason that I have let others tell me that I should not be able to be standing in this pulpit. And I'm standing here because I'm a child of God. And I take my place in ministry and the calling that God has called me to. And that's about all I can take up here, so I'm moving back down there. <laughs> Martin Luther King famously spoke about the arc of justice. And he said the arc of justice moves slowly, but that it is always moving. And the church has historically been far behind the arc of justice that the Spirit is revealing to the rest of the world. I don't consider myself a theologian or a philosopher, but I am a noticer. And I've kind of noticed that church people's discomfort can be measured by the things they say only in a whisper. Have you ever heard someone say, most people don't know, but he's a drinker? Or have you heard Rosemary's oldest daughter is pregnant? And I can remember when my grandparents' neighborhood in, in Flint, Michigan first started becoming racially mixed. And I have to preface this by saying my grandfather was a, a loving man and, and he, he left the church because he was driving the Sunday school bus and he was picking up little Negro children and they weren't happy about it and so he left the church. So um, he had a conviction about that. But even so, there was a discomfort. And I can remember my grandmother saying, I heard that house on the corner just sold to Negroes. Except she probably didn't use that word. And for the most part, people don't discuss race and whispers anymore. And, and I think here at Trinity, we've evolved a great deal in being able to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. But it hasn't been that long ago when people used to talk about gay people like this. I don't know if you've noticed, but he has a little sugar in his shoes. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe to be nice, they, they may say, he's not the marrying type. Or a confirmed bachelor. You see, it's hard to keep the discomfort from showing when we have to deal with a person or an idea that challenges our notions of what is socially acceptable and spiritual to talk about. I was raised in a very strict fundamentalist pastor's home and we didn't discuss sex, let alone homosexuality. And it wasn't even an option to talk about what was going in my, on in my head and in my heart because I, I knew that I would not be loved in the same way by my family and by my church if they knew my secret. And there are enough stories about the pain and the guilt and the suicides of, of gay and lesbian teenagers that you don't need to hear my whole story in detail. But there are also enough stories just in this room this morning that we could fill the rest of our time together. So I'm not going to tell you all of it, but I just want to mention a couple little things. It was lonely to be surrounded by people who talked and sang and witnessed about the love and grace of God when that message of God's love was drowned out by the voices of condemnation and the message that we had the threat of burning in hell forever hanging over us. And there was no one to talk to at home, there was no one to talk to at school, and there was certainly no one to talk to at church. And so I tried praying, and I tried reading my Bible more, and I tried fasting and, and praying again that God would deliver me. I tried reparative therapy, and I tried getting married. And finally, 
I left the church and my marriage and the ministry because I could no longer do the theological gymnastics that it took to reconcile a God of love with the God who would make me in his image and then judge me and send me to eternal damnation. And I was mad at God, and I was mad at my dad, and I was mad at the church, and I was mad because I'd lost everything in the world that meant anything to me. What I wasn't counting on is that my dad would be the person who would change the tra trajectory of my life. Talk to him very little for several years. And one night a few weeks after my partner had died of AIDS, I picked up the phone and I hardly realized what I was doing. But I called my dad. And I was sobbing and he couldn't really understand what I was saying, but, but he knew it was me. And I finally managed to tell him that I knew that I had disappointed him and that I was sorry, but that I was experiencing something that would be equivalent to if mom passed away to him. And it didn't make sense that I couldn't talk to my dad. And in that moment, my father found something in his heart that was greater than his fear. Because he said, Patrick, you need to know that you can never do anything that would make me stop loving you. Many of us get our image of God from our father image on earth. And in that moment, my image of God began to change because I thought, Maybe my Heavenly Father is saying the same thing. You couldn't do anything that would make me stop loving you. And at the root of the struggle for justice that the church has had to stare down around every corner, it has been to love people without conditions and to love them simply because they are a child of God. This morning, as I share my story with you, I get one of those rare glimpses when you know you're in the right place at the right time with the right people. And a few weeks ago, um, I asked Mark if I could prepare an audiovisual presentation about World AIDS Day. And I wanted to bring attention to this issue because it affected my life and also because I wanted to get what bothers me to bother you. And I wanted <laughs> it to bother you that because of the greed of the pharmaceutical companies, millions of people in the world are not getting treatment for AIDS. And so they're dying. And Mark said, go ahead. And after that Sunday, someone came up to me I never would have expected. And I'm going to say they, so you can't even get close enough to guess if it's a male or a female. He said, I don't say that I really understand you, but I love you. And it's a tribute to what Trinity is becoming that I can stand here this morning and be known to you without fear. And I hope I don't presume too much, but you give me the feeling that you might love me as much as I love you. Hmm. And I'm not alone in feeling that. In fact, maybe if you've experienced that here and found a safe place where you weren't safe before, why don't you stand right where you're at? So I'm grateful that someone had the vision to build this building. I'm grateful that this church has been willing to face racism and bigotry. And I don't believe it was just chance that 
prompted a bishop or a district superintendent or whoever decided to take a chance on assigning to Trinity an unconventional young preacher with a ponytail. <laughs> who had um, big dreams about leading a church that has the courage to tackle the things that used to be only spoken in a whisper. Amen. Amen. There was a man who was a um, captain of a slave ship who at one point in the 1700s realized that perhaps the cargo he was carrying was not animals but people. A revelation that many white folks from Europe had not had to date. But there's speculation that he heard the slaves singing songs of redemption on that ship and that the tune that he wrote when he changed his heart, when God changed his heart, he changed his career and stopped driving a slave ship. Whenever we sing this song, uh, Patrick has always converted the words to say, because uh, Patrick never liked, uh, saved a wretch like me. But when you think that the man that wrote that song was a captain of a slave ship, he was right. And really, it would do us well once in a while to sing that word to remind ourselves that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But this song, um, Amazing Grace, is a story of redemption, not only for the African Americans who have been freed, it is a story of redemption because when people are free, even the oppressor is set free as well. And brothers and sisters, I believe Martin Luther King did more to free white America even than he did to free black America. Because when we are gripped with oppression, we all fall short of the kingdom of God. I want to assure you, building a diverse church has not been without comedy, so I'm going to close with one brief story before we offer our invitation. On the same Sunday, when we had changed our music, and Alice Jenkins um, broke both the music barrier and the color barrier at our piano for the first time at Trinity, and we didn't cut anything out of the service, we just added. And so on that same Sunday, I believe it was Bill Porter who grew up in this church, Traditional man, traditional church, and he walked out and he said, man, an hour and a half, you're killing me. <laughs> and true story, that same Sunday, not far behind him, was Freddie Wilson, who I don't see here today. Um, Michael's brother's here. But Freddie Wilson came through with Chiquita. Chiquita was the advanced scout to see if this was a church worth going to. And they came out of the African-American tradition, and Freddie said, man, only an hour and a half, we're joining this church. <laughs> Amen. Each week at Trinity, we offer a three-part invitation, um, a three-part invitation um, that is actually born out of the black church. Um, the first is an invitation to the faith. If you've not begun the journey of faith and you would like to begin it today, um, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I would invite you to come forward and I will pray with you to begin this exciting journey of giving your life to Christ. If you're looking for a church home, know that the doors of this church are always open and you are welcome here. And if you'd like to be a part of this fellowship, I'd invite you to come forward and I'll pray with you today to join the Fellowship of Trinity. United Methodist Church, Trinity Community Church, United Methodist Congregation. Or if you're just in need of prayer, whether it's a prayer for yourself or for someone you love, I'd invite you to come forward and I will pray with you. Will you come?